Welcome to another episode of The Bible Study. We are in season two following along with the Gospel of Mark and we're actually at the tail end. We are in episode 14. So there's only two more, Jason. Two so more, that's it. That's it. Okay. And then we're getting to the crucifixion and all the good stuff. Yeah. But I got to introduce this pastor. This is Jason Kane. It's your first time joining us. It's my us. first time on the Bible study. Yeah. So I'm honored to be here. Don't be a heretic. Uh, I feel like, you know, you got to be theological elite That's to right. make it to this level. So I'm glad to be here, for, at least for this time. At least for this time. We'll yeah. see how it goes for the next one. <laughs> this is like a trial, right? You're like, oh, he was a heretic. Yeah, That's yeah, fine. Let's yeah. not bring him back. Sure. But, you know, actually, Jason's one of my favorite preachers here at Bayside. So I'm super excited to I get I appreciate to it, Dina. Thanks so much. All right, we're gonna jump right in. So all, all of our Bible study sessions, this is what we do. We do context, text, theology, and application. So the context gives you the background so that as we're opening up into these words that we're gonna read, you actually know what's going on. And so for this context, I'm gonna just walk you through the book of Mark because we're in episode 14. Yeah. So we've been in Mark for a little bit of time. Yeah. And if you have been following on, along on the weekend, um, amazing. Make sure that you're getting those weekend messages as well as the Bible study episodes. And if you have not yet done this, make sure to like and subscribe. And then as always, share this so that more people can know the word of God. But let's jump right in. Let me give you the context, the overview of the book of Mark. Right. So the first one is the prologue. Mm -hmm. So the prologue is the introduction of the Messiah. So then we have part one, the Messiah's authority, and this is all about Jesus's identity. So I'm sure you preached on so many of these passages at Blue Oaks, but these are Jesus's miracles. Right. These are some of his most profound teachings. And we see all throughout this segment, there's division. So some people are all on board with what Jesus is saying and doing, and then other people are starting to divide and reject what he is teaching. Right. The climax of part one, it comes in chapter eight, verse 29, and it says this, and he asked them, Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter, one of his disciples answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So basically, and that's the conclusion of part one, it mm -hmm. settles the issue of who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, he is the Christ. Then we transition in the book of Mark to part two, and that one is all about the Messiah's mission, Jesus's role. And so we start with the revelation of the Messiah's suffering. So, so quickly, Jesus starts to share with his disciples, you know who the Messiah is, you know what you think he's come to do, but actually I am the Messiah and what I've come to do is I've come to suffer and die and save the world and it's gonna look really different than what you think. For sure. And then we have the Messiah confronting Jerusalem. And this is where Jesus is in the temple and he's getting into all these infamous um, controversies with the Pharisees, the scribes, the Herodians, and he's winning all of them. Last but not least, which is actually where our passage is found, we have the actual passion of Jesus, his suffering that he predicted. So that's chapters 14 and 15. Then that's followed with the epilogue, which is the announcement of the resurrection. So diving into the specific context for what we're gonna to cover today, the passion of Jesus, we've got five scenes of the passion. It starts with Passover, moves to the Last Supper, then we have Jesus's arrest and Jesus's trial. First he goes before the Jewish authorities and then he goes before the Roman authorities. And last but not least, we have Jesus's crucifixion. So this scene that we're gonna talk about in Mark 14 is we're gonna be talking about the Jewish authorities. When Jesus goes before them, he's actually at that Jewish high priest's home and that's where the scene opens up. So Jason, you wanna take the text? That's right, all right. So Dana, first of all, wonderful job setting up where we are. It seems kind of weird to talk about Easter I know. in June and July. <laughs> so weird. Um, but honestly, I think as believers, it's important for us to visit the Passion every opportunity we get because it does such a great job of reminding us of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Uh, so today we're going to pick up in verse 53, go through verse uh, 65. If you're brand new here to the Bible study, what we do is we go verse by verse. We'll talk about some details. I'll lean on Dina when I have a question because I've got some questions of this text okay. uh, that I'd love for you to answer. Uh, but as Dina has set up the context so wonderfully, Jesus has been arrested and now he's in front of the Jewish authorities. And it's at this time when he's in front of the Jewish authorities, where you talked about how when Peter had this confession that he was the Christ, that Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. 
But we'll see toward the end of this passage that Jesus actually makes the confession himself, which was a weird thing because now he was revealing in all of his glory, hey, this is who I am and this is what I came to do. So verse 53, this is what it reads. It says, they took Jesus to the high priest. All right, now they, let me stop there. <laughs> they is the people who arrested Jesus. They took him to the high priest and to all the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law came together. So in this first verse, verse 53, Jesus has been arrested. They bring him to the high priest. Now, Mark doesn't specify who the high priest is, uh, but we know from some parallel passages that this is Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Why don't you say that for me? Uh, I've always heard it Caiaphas. Caiaphas. There we go. Hey, in the afternoon, sometimes my words don't come out clear. That's why I got Dina right here. Well, they take him to him. He's the high priest of this time. And there's the rest of the Sanhedrin there as well. Sanhedrin was made up of 71 people. Now, one of the questions that were answered is, is this an official trial or is this kind of some unofficial things that are taking place? So Jesus is there. He's at uh, the high priest chambers or this courtyard, and the trial is about to begin for Jesus. He's been arrested, and now he's going to face trial. Uh, verse 54, Peter followed them at a distance. Now, I think this is an important thing that Mark interjects here. And what's also interesting about Mark is I love that he interjects the things that make Peter makes Peter look bad. That's so good. But he doesn't <laughs> always talk about the things that make Peter look good. I don't think he when talked about uh, Peter walking on water. But he was sure to insert Peter in this story to be like, yo, Pete, uh, he was following at a distance. Yeah. Uh, so Jesus, right in the scene before this in the Last Supper, had said that Peter was going to deny him three times. And this kind of begins that denial. As Jesus is facing the trial, Peter follows at a distance. That's key and critical, and we'll come back to that during the application portion. And it says that he sat down with the very people who had arrested Jesus, and he doesn't speak up for Jesus. He doesn't say this is an innocent man. But it says in the passage that he sat there and he warmed his hands up. So he followed Jesus at a distance. Rather than getting involved, he stayed back, and this is, again, where the denial shows up in the life of Peter. So Mark is sure to interject and throw Peter under the bus to say, hey, just in case y'all forget, this is where the denial begins uh, for Peter. Verse 55, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. So the whole plot for these religious leaders is to find a reason to put Jesus to death. And this wasn't anything new uh, for them. This is where they actually are able to do it. But throughout the Gospel of Mark, in several places, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, they were always looking for a reason to kill Jesus. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that you do when you study Scripture is to make sure that you use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Use Scripture to interpret Scripture. When you use Scripture to interpret Scripture, it gives you some clarity about what's going on. So they have been looking for a reason to kill Jesus. And in Mark chapter 3, if you go back all the way to the beginning of Mark, this is what we read. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus was a threat to them from the very start of his ministry, and he continued to be a threat to them. As a matter of fact, early in, earlier in chapter 14, it says, Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread... We're only two days away. Listen, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly. Listen, and kill him. These folks hated Jesus. They wanted Jesus out of the picture. They were doing everything they could to get rid of him. And now this is somewhat coming to a culmination. They had a plot to kill him, but Jesus wasn't going to be killed until the right time. Uh, had come. Moving on to verse 56. So they set up this trial. Trial is taking place. They have all these witnesses. All these people have seen Jesus do so many different things. And this is what we read in verse 56. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. So in a Jewish trial, there would be no prosecutor. All they would do is they'd take people and people would serve as witnesses. And in order for someone to be guilty or to be convicted of a crime, they'd have to have two or more witnesses testify the same thing against them. So there's a crowd of people. As a matter of fact, the crowd is so large that Peter is able to blend in with the crowd. Nobody knows Peter is there. So we're talking about a large number of people that are gathered here, and they have this big crowd of people. They've been plotting and scheming since chapter 3 to arrest Jesus. But when, they come, when it comes down to it, when the trial begins, they can't even find two people to agree to find reason or find cause for Jesus to be convicted of anything. And the reason was, was because he's sinless. He had done nothing wrong. Um, so 
Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6 over in the Old Testament gives us this clarity of how many witnesses are need, needed in order to put somebody uh, to death. So this trial takes place in this courtyard, uh, but here's some uh, where theologians differ on some things. Some theologians suggest that this was an actual real trial. Other theologians suggest that this was just a gathering of people from the Sanhedrin as they were continuing to get their plot. Uh, the reason that some will say that this is not a formal trial is because it didn't re meet the decorum for a trial. So here in America, if someone goes to trial, there's certain things that have to happen. There's right. jury selection that happens, mm -hmm. and then there's opening statements, and then it just follows the, whatever the order of the case, and then eventually they have uh, the jury is deliberating, they have a conviction, and then they have sentencing. So there's this very specific thing that would have to happen in the midst of a trial, where well, the same was true for a Jewish trial. And the reason that some theologians suggest that this is an informal trial is because no trial was supposed to be held at night. If you look at the context of this passage, this trial was held at night. A second is that the verdict in a case where somebody's put to death, it could not be reached until the second day. And therefore, trials could not be held on the eve of the Sabbath or a feast day, which is what was happening here. So that's a reason, another reason that theologians will say this is not an official trial. Third, Witnesses had to be warned to relate only true and firsthand testimony. Well, we know they didn't have any true testimony because none of their testimony matched. A fourth reason is those accused of blasphemy or claiming to be God could be convicted only if they reviled the, the, not, the divine name, which Jesus did not do. Fifth, trials could not be held in a palace of a high priest. Well, that's where this trial was taking place. And sixth, the Old Testament does not specify crucifixion as a punishment. So what is the point that I'm making here? Why am I reading off all these six reasons <laughs> why this is an official trial? Yeah. This is the point. When somebody wants to put Christ to death, when they have been plotting and scheming, they'll break even their own rules yeah. to do it. Yeah. And so as you read throughout scripture and as you look throughout this passage, you have to realize there was a decorum that was supposed to take place. But these people had got to the point where no matter what Jesus did, they were going to put him to death. It's clear that this is a, an official trial because there are some things that happen that make it an actual trial, and we'll see that toward the end. All right, moving along, verse 57, it says, then some stayed, let me go back to 56. It says, many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Verse 57, then some stood up and gave false testimony against him. 58, we heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build up another not made with human hands. So what's happening here? So there have been some people who have been clearly following Jesus throughout his ministry and had heard some of the things that he had said. And they said, man, Jesus said, if, he were, if they were to destroy the temple, that he would build the temple back up. They're talking about the physical and literal temple. And Jesus had said a version of that, but he hadn't said exactly that. Again, we see that there's a plot to kill Jesus. They're breaking all these rules of decorum. Now they're just flat out lying, saying that Jesus said something that in fact he did not say. They said he said that he would destroy the temple. Well, this is what Jesus actually said. In John chapter 2, verse 19 and 21, it says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. Okay, now it sounds like they're saying what Jesus said, but let's continue reading in verse 20. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. They're talking about the physical temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. Mm -hmm. So Jesus had said a version of this, but he wasn't talking about the physical temple that took 46 years to build. He was talking about his actual body. And what he was really making a prediction of was his resurrection that was to take place. Right. So these witnesses make this statement about him destroying the temple, but they clearly hadn't stayed or heard the entire teaching of Jesus. And if you teach at all, you know that people will take your words and twist them to make them what they want them to say. I'm not going to pause there and talk for too long because I'm going to rant <laughs> about being taken out of context, but we're going to leave it there. All right. So moving right along, verse 60. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked, so all these people give their testimony. They can't find anybody to agree. The high priest is like, man, look, this is a sham. What do y'all have going on? The high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus. He's like, look, I'm going to just go straight to the source. I'm going to start asking Jesus. And Our, Jesus has been quiet. He's right? been quiet. Hasn't time. said a word. Hasn't said a mumbling word. We're about to see that even more. Uh, so the high priest says, are you going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. So while all these people are lying on Jesus, making up stuff, he says nothing. The high priest asks him directly, look, you're not going to defend yourself? Jesus is like, I don't need to defend a lie. I'm not saying anything. And he kept silent. All right, whenever you're reading scripture, the reason that I love 
God's word is because it always connects and and it it always it's it's living and breathing and there's always something going on behind the scenes. So Jesus is silent. If you just read this on its own, you're like, man, why isn't Jesus defending himself? Why isn't he standing up saying they're all lying? If Jesus has this authority and he can teach so well, this seems like the proper time to defend himself. But remember, Jesus was not there in defense of himself. He was there to be the Messiah. And so he understood that there were some Old Testament prophecies that he had to fulfill. One of them is in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verse 7. It says he was oppressed, oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears and is silent. So he did not open his mouth. What's happening here in Mark chapter 14, verse 60 is Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. The prophecy that says that the Messiah would be oppressed and afflicted. He'd be taken like a lamb to slaughter and he would not say anything. And that's exactly what Jesus does here in verse 60 uh, and 61. Continuing in verse 62. uh, Let's go back to 61. Verse 61 says, but Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked, are you the Messiah? Now it's about to get real. He's asking him straight up, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And this is what Jesus says. Verse 62, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming in the clouds of heaven. Verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes, Jesus' clothes that is. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked, you have just heard blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy to be taken to death. So in 60, verse 61 and 62, what happens here is some Christology. Christology. That is a great word. Big fancy word I got from my uh, (laughs) seminary degree. I feel like I'm finally putting it to use after all the money I spent for it. Christology. (laughs) It's just a fancy word. Talk about the study of Christ. Who is Christ? One of the things that Mark is looking to do right here is to reveal who Christ is. So, Caiaphas, man, I'm so mad I can't say his name. I'm saying it right in my head, but it's not coming out of my mouth. The high priest, we'll just call him that. He looks at Jesus, he says, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, I am. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason they would call this blasphemy is because no one could claim to be the Messiah Mm -hmm. unless they were the Messiah. I mean, there were a lot of people, just like in today's world, that claim, hey, I'm the savior of the world. Well, Jesus didn't just make the claim, he lived the claim. He was exactly who he claimed to be. And just because they said it was false did not mean that he was not the Messiah. So there's some Christology that happens here. Uh, He uses the word Messiah. We also see the the phrase son of man. Jesus says in verse 62 that he's sitting at the right hand of the father. Remember, the best way to interpret scripture is with scripture. So again, Jesus is fulfilling some Old Testament prophecies uh, in Daniel and in Psalm, which I'm not going to talk about right now. We're going to let Dina talk about that when we get to the theology section. All right, closing this out. Verse 64, uh, you have heard the blasphemy. That's what Caiaphas says. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy to death. Verse 65, then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Uh, that's the passage for today. We've gone verse by verse by verse to talk about what happens to Jesus as he's arrested, as he faces trial. And now Dina's going to talk to us about some theology that we see in the passage as well. it. Thank you, Jason. That's so good. So we're going to dive into Christology, just like you said. Um, but honestly, this is this Christology is a bigger part of the doctrine of the Trinity. There we go. And the Trinity is the one of the most essential and the most unique theological um, concepts in Christianity. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're in Mark 14. And so I feel like we're getting towards the end. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to drive home the Trinity, because I think if you study Christian history, it's one of the most controversial ideas within Christianity. And it's almost like a litmus test for orthodoxy, whether yeah. someone believes or doesn't believe. So right. Before we dive in, Jason, as a pastor, has has anyone ever come up to you and said, I just have a hard time believing the whole idea of the Trinity? Yeah, not just (laughs) believing it. I think some people can't even understand it. Yeah, like Um, what does it say? And it's a lot easier when they say, I don't understand it versus I don't believe it. Exactly. And I love how you said that. There's a huge difference between saying I don't understand it and Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. Um, I don't believe it puts you in the camp of a heretic. I don't understand it puts you in the camp of a human being. It's probably a great thing to say, I don't understand it. 
So we're gonna dive in. I'm gonna teach the Trinity. You feel free to stop me if you're like, you're speaking gibberish, <laughs> Dina. That's that's fine. This is a hard thing to teach. Yeah, that happens. But I'm gonna do my darndest. Sure. So the word Trinity is actually not in the Bible. So mm-hmm. let's start there. So there, there's no there's no verse that says God is triune. That, that word was actually invented as shorthand for three separate main and plain teachings of scripture. So that's something that we have to grapple with is basically the doctrine of the Trinity is not from one verse that you know says God is triune. Rather, it's from taking the whole sweep of scripture and putting it together and saying, what does, what does scripture teach about God? And when you put all of the teachings together about what scripture says about God, you emerge with the doctrine of the Trinity. So what are those three separate main and plain teachings of scripture? Scripture First, there is one God. That's the easy one. We kind of know that. That's, you know, Jews were infamous for their monotheism. They still are. There is one God. Uh, The second is that God is three distinct persons. We know them as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For instance, um, when Jesus tells his disciples to baptize, he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Third teaching is that each person is fully God. So we have, there is one God, God is three distinct persons, and each person is fully God. Those are the three ideas of scripture that are taught main and plain, that when you put them together, that is what the Trinity is. So the thing is, it's not hard to believe any of those three. It's not hard to say that the Father is God. Plenty of scriptures teach that the Father is God. Plenty of scriptures teach that Jesus is God. Plenty of scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit is God. It's not hard to see that each person is fully God, and it's certainly not hard to teach that there, to see that there is one God. The real challenge of the Trinity is when you take the finite human brain and you try to put all three of those ideas right. in there at one time. Right. So as a philosophy person, I have actually sat down and I've tried to like find the logical contradiction. Mm-hmm. There is no strictly speaking logical contradiction between these three ideas, but it is almost impossible to understand how these three ideas can come together. Right. So a few ideas uh, about the Trinity. Um, First of all, this is just straight up revelation. Mm -hmm. This is not something that some clever human being sat down in a chair and they were thinking, how do we make Christianity hard to believe? I know, the Trinity. This is something that God, through his word, revealed. Um, So how how it is that God is three yet one? So many question marks. Mm -hmm. But that he is three and one is revelation. It's something that God has told us about himself. Um, This cannot be fully understood. The infamous analogy here, it's attributed to Augustine. We don't really know if this this actually happened in Augustine. It might be more fable, but it's a great analogy. It's basically like trying to understand the Trinity is like trying to fit the entire ocean inside of a cup. A cup is finite and, and the ocean is so much larger than what the cup can contain. So it actually, rather than being disturbing that we can't understand the Trinity, it's what we should expect, Mm. right? Because God is not something that we human beings who have finite understandings and I literally can't even figure out how to work my remote sometimes, I shouldn't expect that I fully understand God. Um, Moving on though, it's unique and essential to Christianity. The first of the several great theological splits and debates within Christianity concerned the Trinity specifically Christology, Mm -hmm. Jesus's divinity. Over and over again, in the beginning of Christianity, um, the main and plain teachings of scripture and the church was that Jesus claimed to be divine and that he deserved to be worshiped as God. And yet along came these people who would try different ways of explaining away Jesus's divinity. And every single time that the church assembled at one of the great councils, and they took on this issue of, did Jesus really claim to be divine? Was he fully human? Was he fully um, divine? Every time they emerged with a clear and clearer statement that affirmed both Jesus's divinity and his humanity. Still, um, today, there's this question, Mm -hmm. who is Jesus? It's asked all through the beginning parts of Mark, and even we see and it's Jesus's you know, final moments of his life, and he is being asked this question, right. who are you? 
So a few things, Judaism, they say that Jesus is a respected teacher and miracle worker. He claimed to be the Messiah, but he was not. Islam reveres Jesus. He is, he is regarded as one of the highest prophets. Hinduism says Jesus is a God, lowercase God. Buddhism says Jesus is an enlightened man. The New Age movement says he's a wise moral teacher. Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, cults of Christianity, they say he's a separate being from God. He's God-like, but he's not the ultimate God. And then lately, I don't know if you've heard this one, Jason, it's, a, it's if you go on YouTube and you just search like skeptics or atheists or agnostic, they, they have tapped into this thing called the Christ myth theory, where they deny that Jesus even existed. Right. They say, you know, Jesus didn't really exist, or if he did exist, he basically bears no resemblance to the historical figure of Jesus right. as, been, as has been presented by most world religions. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, most of them involve history. Right. And, but still there's this idea that Jesus' identity, it, everyone has an idea about it. Mm-hmm. And so I think as we're transitioning and we're going to be leaving behind the gospel of Mark, which I hope for years afterwards uh, our Bayside family uses as really an outline to understand the story of Jesus, I think we should land this question by asking who did Jesus say he was? So the first sign that you're in a cult is that someone has said, we have some special knowledge about Jesus Christ. He's not who you think that he is. So let's pause and review what Mark actually has to say about who Jesus is. Um, First thing, Jesus is human. So over and over again, Mark actually emphasizes the humanity of Jesus Christ, which makes sense because Mark is writing to some suffering Christians in Rome, and he wants them to understand that they haven't failed just because they're suffering. Rather, Christ himself, God himself had to endure suffering. It's just part of the human experience. So Mark specifically mentions his limited knowledge, his limited power. He over and over again talks about how he expresses his feelings. He gets tired. So Jesus is human, according to Mark. Also, no argument here. Jesus is Messiah. He came to suffer, die, and provide salvation. But also a very clear theme all throughout Mark, which climaxes in Jesus' announcement of who he is, is that Jesus is God. First, he claims the rights and authority that God has. For example, he calms a storm. He feeds 5,000 and then 4,000. He walks on water. He casts out demons. He heals blindness, skin disease, a paralyzed man, a bleeding woman, a daughter who appeared dead, a a deaf and mute man. Um, A really interesting one is that he forgives sin, Mm -hmm. which is a power that if you're a Jew, you understand that no one other than God has the power to forgive sin. He declares himself Lord of the Sabbath. And then he even tells this story about, he clarifies this Old Testament passage where David, the patriarch, one of the greats of the um, Jewish faith, refers to Jesus as Lord. And so saying there's, there's so much more to the idea of Messiah than you think. And then Jesus stands before the high priest, okay? So the ultimate Jewish authority. And he's going to make his clearest declaration. Yeah. To answer this question, because I think he knew for all time, this was going to be the question. Mm -hmm. Who are you, Jesus Christ? Um, First, he he claims that he is the son and that he has a special relationship to the father. Then he makes a reference to two Old Testament passages, as you mentioned. So both Psalm 110, verse 1, and Daniel 7, 13 through 14 have the same idea that God is going to vindicate Jesus Christ and exalt him to a position of glory. So that is the meaning of his quotations. He's coming on the clouds of glory. God himself is going to vindicate Jesus and exalt him to a position of glory. He will be given all glory and honor and all nations, and this is the key idea if you're a Jew, all nations will worship him. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the great commandment of monotheism? You don't worship anyone but God, right? Right. That's if you're a Jew and you know anything about God, you know that you can only worship God. So Jesus is claiming to be God. And he's saying, I myself am going to receive your worship, whether it is in a um, humbly submitted bowed knee, or you're just at the end of your life going to have to confess that I am God and worship me. 
And last but not least, um, he uses the I am statement, which again, if you're a Jew, he, said, he says a simple response before he goes into the Old T- Testament quotations. He says, I am. Right. And that's significant right. because when Moses, the patriarch, says, um, hey, God, tell me, you know, tell me what your name is. Yeah. And what does God say? Tell them I am am has sent you. It's the name of God. Jesus himself is taking that name and applying it to himself. There is a reason that throughout the centuries, every time this question has been raised, Orthodox Christianity has declared Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus claimed to be God. It's so clear throughout scripture. I'll never forget. I was, um, I was in my essential Christian theology class and I got a seminary degree too. And so glad that we can use it now. And I remember my teacher saying like most heretics don't wake up on the wrong side of the bed Mm. and think I'm going to destroy the church today. Mm. Rather what happens is they get so concerned about defending one doctrine of Christianity that they end up excluding Mm. another doctrine because they can't bear to live with the tension of affirming both. And I think, honestly, that's the great takeaway for us. The Trinity, like we said, it's hard to comprehend. Right. Uh, as, as you said, believing it versus understanding it. We are called, because it's revelation, it's what God, what Jesus himself said about himself, we have to believe it. Jesus is somehow both human and God. Can't fully understand it, but we must believe it. So I would just encourage us, like as we transition into application, we must affirm that Jesus Christ is God. <clears throat> right. And we can't, we can't lower Jesus' status just so that we can relieve some tension mm-hmm. within our brains. Yeah. I, I mean, I think an essential thing that, that happens in the gospel is there's someone who encounters Jesus and he says, man, help me with my unbelief. I believe, mm-hmm. I help me with my one. unbelief. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with having a measure of unbelief uh, that you hand over to God and say, help me with this. Um, I think there are times where we want to understand, like I want to have a comprehensive understanding of who fully Jesus is. But in our finite minds, as you've said so eloquently, we cannot understand it. Uh, I don't understand all the facets of of science and gravity and all the other things that happen, but I know that they work. And I I trust that. And the same way is, is true with Jesus. As we talk about Um, the application portion of things, I think you've made a very strong application for all of us is that we have to believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he is. Mm -hmm. Uh, As you look at verses 62 uh, and you look at the the names for Jesus here, I am, I'm sitting on the right hand of the father. I'm the mighty one. All of those are theological terms that when you dive into reveal a part of who Christ is all human and all divine. A statement that seems to be a contradiction and does not make sense, but one that we seek to understand over time as God reveals himself to us. Uh, I think another uh, another key thing here is when we look at the life of Peter, one of the applications we can look at from verse 54, it says Peter followed as a, uh, at a distance mm-hmm. right into the courtyard of the high priest. Uh, remember, Jesus had just told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Yeah. And in verse 54, we see the start of what that denial is. I think when we stray away or we fall away from Christ, it often happens in a very casual Mm. uh, manner, in in a very slow manner. Mm. Often people don't walk up, wake up and say, you know what, I'm done with Jesus. But it happens slowly. Mm -hmm. And listen, it happens to Peter because the more distance he kept between himself and Christ, Mm -hmm. the more apt he was to deny Christ. And the more distance we keep from Christ, from his word, from listening to who he is, from allowing the Holy Spirit to penetrate penetrate our hearts, the more apt we'll be Mm -hmm. to eventually deny Jesus by how we, by how we act and behave. I think another critical thing here is these people were determined from the beginning of Mark until now to find a reason to put Jesus on trial and to put him on a cross and to put him to death. Uh, I think when we try to do with Jesus things that aren't true to who scripture says he he is, Mm -hmm. then we'll find ourselves justifying our actions Mm. as these people did in this passage. They were going to find a way to put Jesus on Mm -hmm. the cross. They had made up in their minds that this is what was going to happen. And we can tend to do that in our own lives. The bigger takeaway, the bigger application, I think, that we have to wrap our heads around in this passage is what the gospel of Mark does for us. 
and it is to answer the question, who is Jesus? Yeah. I mean, sir, there's a lot of application that you can get, but the ultimate application is, who do you believe Jesus is? And that's what our study of Mark has been from every Sunday to these Wednesday nights, is to reveal who Jesus is. Yeah. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He's the one who laid down his life for us so that we could experience eternal life. I love it. And I, I feel like there might be some listening who they've been trekking with the Bible study for whatever reason, and maybe it's overturned some of their conceptions about who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. So Jason, where does it start when, when you finally, you decide to push to the side your preconceptions about who Jesus is and start actually embracing who he says he is? Like, what is what does that turn look like? And what is starting a relationship with Jesus as he reveals himself actually look like? Yeah, I think it starts with two things, humility and surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to humble myself mm -hmm. and I'm going to surrender to who Christ says he is. Yeah. There goes my pencil. <laughs> I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to surrender to who Christ says he is. Mm -hmm. And I think as you do that over time, the more you'll, re you'll, the more you'll notice actually who he is and the more Christ will reveal himself to you. I also can't let us get off this without talking about uh, my friend Mark Clark's book, The Problem of yes, Jesus. it's so good. As you're trying to discover and discern and understand who Jesus is, man, pick up that book and read it. Uh, I've been following Jesus for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but by no means have I arrived at where I want to be. And, and Mark's book was very, 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 uh, it helped to fortify the foundation of my faith. So I want to encourage everybody to pick that up. I love it. That's super practical. So that's Mark 14. That's Mark 14. And we have a lot to look forward to in the next couple chapters. Obviously, with the crucifixion of Jesus, um, some hard parts, but there's something that's so good about reading the actual passion narrative of what Jesus endured for our sake so that we could have a relationship with Jesus that is so good. So don't forget to watch the next couple of episodes of the Bible study. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Jason, for Appreciate teaching. It. I for think me be here. I think you did a good job. We'll probably have you back. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and with that, I just want to remind you, join us on the weekend. Like, subscribe. And especially if there's anyone in your life that you think needs a, a reminder or maybe a complete upheaval of that question of who Jesus is, make sure to share this with them. We just want the, the word of God to go forth and to transform people's lives. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.